From training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 43. I'm really excited for today's guest because he's a guy I've seen speak many times. He's become a good friend as we've traveled the country speaking on the same Perform Better seminar tour, and he's always a guy that I love to watch present because he brings some great insights and really uh, adds a lot to the baseball community coming from an outsider who spent a lot of time in golf. So we're in for a really, really good show today. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's an all-in-one superfood supplement with 75 whole food sourced ingredients to support your body's nutritional needs across five critical areas energy, immunity, gut health, hormonal support, and healthy aging. I'm an avid user of Athletic Greens myself in spite of the fact that I tend to be a supplement minimalist. To me, this is a product that is much more like whole food nutritional insurance as opposed to a true supplement. The ingredients have been carefully selected at the highest quality, most natural source. You get essential vitamins and minerals, digestive enzymes, prebiotics, probiotics, and that's a the zero compromise approach from the company. It's plant-based sourced from whole foods at the highest quality. You won't find harmful chemicals, artificial colors or flavors, preservatives or added sugar. Um, Really, it's perfect for folks who are gluten and dairy free, paleo, keto, vegan friendly, um, great for people who are intermittent fasting, all that fun stuff. Um, Personally, I love it for for obviously our athletes who don't get enough nutritional uh, benefits from fruits and vegetables because they don't eat enough. So it's a way to kind of plug in holes in diets. But also, I really like it for our college and professional athletes who may have complex travel schedules where quality food options aren't always at hand. Um, On a personal level, I'm a husband, father of three, and an entrepreneur. Um, We split our time between two states, and and I'm also still an avid lifter. Um, So life is inherently crazy, and it can be stressful, and sleep deprivation is definitely something that we encounter. So I rely on Athletic Greens um, for part of my immune support and believe firmly that it's it's made a big difference in keeping me healthy in spite of how crazy our lifestyle is. Um, They've got a great offer in place. If you head to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, They'll get you 20 free travel packets with your purchase. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, and you can claim your special offer. Today's guest is a board-certified doctor of chiropractic and holds an engineering degree from the University of Maryland. He specializes in sports biomechanics, strength and conditioning, manual therapy, rehabilitation, and therapeutic exercises as they relate to sports. He helped pioneer the field of analyzing three-dimensional motion capture models of athletes, and that research has helped teaching professionals all over the world gain a better understanding of how the body works during athletic movements. He's the co-founder of the Titleist Performance Institute, a research and testing facility built by Titleist to help analyze, train, and develop the best golfers in the world. He's since become one of the most requested speakers in golf, health, and fitness, and was actually the co-host of the Golf Fitness Academy seen on the Golf Channel for 10 years, and was also shown in over 30 countries. He's one of the co-developers of the Selective Functional Movement Assessment and co-owners of Functional Movement Systems. FMS has revolutionized the field of movement assessment and changed the way many sporting organizations and healthcare practitioners diagnose musculoskeletal injuries. More recently, he founded and launched RacketFit and OnBase University. RacketFit is the first tennis-specific certification offered by the United States Professional Tennis Association for health and fitness professionals. Meanwhile, OnBase University is the first baseball and softball specific certification program of its kind, offered both health and fitness professionals. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Greg Rose. All right, welcome to the show, Greg. Hey, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I am very excited about this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send some sunshine your way because we've spoken together on the Perform Better Tour for... I don't know. I'm, I've lost track. Time. It's been a long time. I started when I was 25 and I'm 38 now. So it's, I'm losing track of years, but I'll say this. So every year we, we speakers get the email from Chris Boyer with basically the topics and the presenters and what times they're at. So you always kind of go and you look at who you're up yep. against and I do the same uh, thing. all those, right? And, and you are the only presenter that for me is a must attend. And I've always been that way because I saw you in Long Beach, actually, I think it was 2009 for the first time. And it was a, it was like an aha moment for me because I realized 
this golf guy has a lot of material that's going to carry over to baseball. And now you've become even more of a must attend because now you're doing baseball. So you've made it even easier <laughs> for me. So I want to, I want to hear about where it all started. Like what, I, I, by the way, that means yeah. a ton. I, I really, I <laughs> really you. appreciate it. That's <laughs> yeah. Um, where did it all start for me? Yeah. yeah. I want to, I want to hear the story of, you know, what led to TPI and then, you know, obviously on to more recently on base you, I know you've got a, a million things yeah. going. So tell me the story. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So, uh, how much time we got? <laughs> you know, as so, much as you need. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, my, my story, I, uh, when I, when I went to college, I thought I was going to be an engineer. So I, I, I went to engineering, University of Maryland, um, was doing civil engineering, structural engineering, and, um, really didn't, I played soccer and volleyball when I was in high school and a little bit in college. And, um, I got a job with a engineering company while I was in college and they said, you know, a lot of business is done on the golf course and do you play golf? And I said, nope. And they're like, you need to learn. So I went out and played golf. And I always say that uh, when you play golf for the first time, one of two things happens, either you get completely addicted or you freaking hate the sport and never want to play again. <laughs> I, I obviously became addicted. And I said this, there's this unique phenomenon where your GPA and your handicap do the same thing. They both start going down. So I started playing a lot, a lot of golf. And, uh, just fell in love with it and basically became a scratch golfer, you know, before I left Maryland and I I didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I hated engineering, but I knew that I wanted golf to be part of it. And my senior year at, uh, at Maryland, I was the starter at the golf course. I met uh, these three chiropractors that would play golf out there and they started convincing me that I should go into medicine and look, I went in part. I decided I added a fifth year of Maryland, got my Pre, pre-med minor, went out to chiropractic school. And when I graduated chiropractic school, I was like, I got to do something with golf. And I, I basically opened a practice in, in Washington, D.C., right outside of uh, D.C. in Maryland called Advantage Golf. Started working with golfers. Uh, everybody told me I was crazy that you can't just like, I'm sure they told you you're crazy. You see, you're just going to work with baseball players. Yeah. And I, that's it. Chasing the yeah, I was like, you know what? Hey, I can always go be a regular chiropractor, but I want to be a golf chiropractor. And in five years, I had over 3,000 patients that were golfers from all over the world. And one day, uh, this golf pro from Baltimore called me. His name's Dave Phillips. And he said, I got this really special client. I want to bring him and his dad down. I said, no problem. It was this 10-year-old boy named Peter walks in with his dad and take him through what we were doing. And next thing I know, the dad's like, this is one of the coolest things I've ever seen. And I, I think you can help me sell a lot of golf balls. And I'm like, I don't, what do you mean I can help you sell a lot of golf balls? Well, I didn't realize he was the CEO of Titleist and his son, Peter Uline, is now on the PGA Tour. Um, and he was like, uh, you know, the USGA governing bodies can limit what we can do in technology to limit development. He goes, but nobody can ever stop the development of the human body. And if you can make people play longer, play better, that's billions of dollars for us because the average golfer loses five to six golf balls every time they play. If you can help us show them how to do stuff and <laughs> So I started consulting with Titleist. They were just incredible as a resource to help us do stuff. And then in 2003, he asked me to take over. Uh, he, well, he basically came and he said, you know, nobody in golf, this is Wally Uline, the CEO of Titleist at the time, said, you know, nobody in, in most sports, like as you know, baseball teams have a training staff, football teams have a training staff, soccer teams have a training staff. And he's like, but we don't really have a training staff and we have lots of players that we support. And he's like, don't you think we should have one? And I'm like, yeah, I think it's crazy you don't. And he's like, well, why don't you and Dave kind of tell me what you think we should do? Like, and he flew us out to a facility in San Diego and he said, just tell us what you would do here. Like, to, how would you set this up? Like, design the performance center. So we, we laid out in 2002 this entire, like, here, here's what we would build if we had the dream. And he came back to us at the end of 2002 and said, I love everything you guys did. He goes, I want to build the entire performance center. He goes, on one caveat, he goes, I'll build it. If the two of you drop what you're doing, come out here and run it for me. And I was like, uh, twist my arm. <laughs> and in 2003, we moved to San Diego, which is where I live now, and basically became the head of all you know player development and health and fitness for Tylus worldwide. And, you know, I always say, Eric, like when, you know, back in the days, you know, working with the FMS guys and we were always working with different sports, right? And if you work with football teams or basketball teams or baseball teams, like baseball was always the worst because there were so many players, right? So when you take on a team, you're, you're committing to trying to manage 300 and some players, right? Like basketball is always the best. Like NBA is like, you got like 20 players and you got like 30 staff for those 20 players, right? 
So, so when the <laughs> CEO of Thailand said, hey, I want you to take care of the golfers, I was like, oh, well, there's only 125 players on the PGA Tour. I'm like, how many of them could be Titleist players? I'm like, this has got to be easy. Not really thinking. And when I, we took the job and went out there, uh, we come to realize that they sponsored over 8,000 players worldwide. Right. So I'm like, oh, my God, I think we have the largest team in the world. So so it, the good news was and I always like to say this, too, is that I felt like we had a huge advantage in golf, very different than baseball, because in baseball, who runs baseball? In my opinion, it's owners. Right. So owners run the run the sport. And what do owners spend their money on? Uh, it could be a lot of things. Players, 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 players are probably is your number biggest. one for yeah. sure. Right. And then if there's money left over, <laughs> yeah. there's development stuff. Well, you think about like golf, who runs golf? There's no owners. It's manufacturers. Yeah. It's like I would say Formula One, golf, they're, they're run by manufacturers and manufacturers spend their money on research and development mm-hmm. for products. Mm-hmm. So it's been really cool. The Performance Institute at Titleist, you know, for, for the last, you know, uh, how many years now? Let's see, 16 years, 17 years is we've had such great resources to do research and development and learn and try and figure out how to develop. And now, you know, it's opened the doors for us to do it in so many different sports, which is, it's just been, it's been a really cool ride. So that's kind of how TPI started. That's super interesting. And, and you know what? You glazed over like an incredibly invaluable lesson for everybody who's listening. And, and honestly, there's some parallels to what we did in the baseball world. But I mean, you basically said that was, that was 2003, I think. Yep. When, when he approached you. Like, I, I don't know about you where, where you were at in 1999. I sent my first email. <laughs> right. So, right. so th- like basically that speaks to like the internet was not what it is now back then. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I remember, <laughs> I remember playing like fantasy basketball, like during college. That was my senior year of, of undergrad and, and starting grad school. Like there was nothing available. Nothing. Like, you had to scratch and claw. I think that was the first year. Yeah, well, I, let, I read, let me, I, yeah, let me drive this yeah. out. So. When the CEO yeah. came into our facility, when, when Wally came to our facility in D.C., he was like, I've never seen technology like this before. We were doing some of the early 3D motion capture. Now, like in baseball, you know, companies like KVS or just, you know, it's yeah. like a tidal wave going through there. Um, so we had one of the first 3D motion capture systems in sports. And it was me and there was another guy. And, and the first motion capture that we did was with Eric Gagne when he was with the Dodgers. At Barrow Beach. This is before golf. He asked us to yeah. come down there and evaluate him. We took a PVC cube, like a cube made out of PVC. We put it on the mound. We had two two video cameras with the VCR tapes, you know, like yeah. on our shoulders, <laughs> right? So that we would we would put it two different angles. We didn't lock the camera, so they weren't like gen locked together. We would film the cube, we'd move the cube out of the way, and then Eric would pitch, and then we would go back and we would hand digitize. It would take an hour per pitch to get any data. And we would be like, this is such state of the art. We'll get you data in two days. <laughs> I mean, I mean it, was, it was a different world. Yeah. I tell our guys, I mean, John O'Neill is our director of performance at our Massachusetts facility. And when our interns walk in, yeah. John has a 42 page curriculum right. waiting for them. And they've gone through a 10 week online course before they right. get there. Like, I, 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 we're going to sound like the old guys, but like kids these days don't realize like <laughs> how, how good they've got it. I'm sure, you know, 20 years from now, you know, that ger- generation will have it even better, but oh, it's crazy to think how much we were like scratching and calling to not just find information, but like find good equipment, get access to whatever technology. My daughter, my daughter's a senior in high school this year and she was complaining to me about how hard it was to do research for a project and i'm like please don't even like you have the internet like don't tell me how hard it was to get research yeah. they've never <laughs> they've never dealt with the dewey decimal system <laughs> exactly so explain to me how how tpi eventually morphed into what you're doing with on base you now okay so so basically we i get this like what do you mean we have eight thousand players and we got to manage these eight thousand players so real quickly we realized we couldn't handle eight thousand players at our facility so uh, I went to the CEO and I was like, listen, I've done some seminars in the past. I go, I think we need to teach people how to do what we do or else we're never going to get the right care for our players. And he was like, do it, do whatever you want. And I was like, so, you know, we're doing a lot of cool research here and we're learning a lot of cool things. I go, can I like share that with people? And the CEO was like, well, why wouldn't we, right? Won't it make people play better and they'll, they'll buy more golf balls. And I'm like, well, normally I'm used to people saying, Hey, if we got a secret, you can't share it. And he's like, Oh no, share everything which has been phenomenal, right? So, so basically I said, let's create a certification program, right? And let's, let's, if you're a golf coach, if you're a fitness professional or medical professional that can work with players and are interested to learn what we're learning, come to these workshops. 
So we started that in a way, in a selfish way to say, we need teams to help our players get better no matter where they are in the world. So we started doing these seminars and Erica just, it took off, right? Like we now have the second largest certification after the PGA of America in the world for golf. And we have over 23,000 golf professionals, fitness professionals, and medical professionals that are certified all over the world. And, and it's just been, it was, you know, it was such a, it was such a necessity in the golf world. And as we have been doing this for years in the golf world, we launched that, that certification business in 2005. Every year we get guys from other sports that come in and go, you know, I want to learn something that in golf and see if I can apply it in hockey or if I can apply it to cricket or baseball. And one of the, one of the, in 2000, let me make sure I get this right. 2004, late 2004, I got a phone call from, uh, or my, our, our receptionist at TPI calls me and says, Hey, there's a baseball pitcher on the phone, wants to come in and get fit for clubs. Uh, are, do we, do we allow this? And normally we, it was for Titleist players only. Right. And I was like, no, we don't really, I go, but I go, who is it? Let me know. And the, in the, my receptionist comes back and says, it's a Dr. Tom house. And now I was a huge fan of Tom's research because we were doing all kinds of crazy research with motion capture. And Tom had done a lot of biomechanics work, obviously on pictures. And I was like, ask him, is that the Tom house who does the biomechanics work? And she goes back, she goes, yes, that one. I go, put him through real quick. So Tom just randomly calls Tylus to get fit. And I, and I get him on the phone and I'm like, Hey, listen, dude, I'm a huge fan of yours. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally into biomechanics. And he's like, well, I'll tell you what, he goes, if you let me come in and get club fit, I'll share everything I know with you. And I'm like, when do you want to come in? Right. So, <laughs> so Tom comes, Tom comes in and um, we start collaborating and he started bringing me pictures. So I had lots of data on pictures and players and, um, uh, even, you know, from all, all different, uh, let's say levels from college, to mm -hmm. professional level stuff. And when we were doing these workshops, because I think the relationship with Tom, I think Tom was telling a lot of baseball coaches, Oh, you should go check out the TPI workshops because it's mm -hmm. great information. Yeah. And, and, um, and just to make a long story short is I kept going, man, we should really, you know, instead of these guys having to connect the dots, take the golf stuff and how do I apply it to baseball or how do I apply it to tennis? I'm like, we have a lot of data that they probably don't have with the research we're doing with baseball and some of these other sports that we could kind of connect those dots for them. And I'd been getting pushed by Steve Johnson, who wrote the art and science of pitching with Tom House. Um, he was like, dude, we got to do this for baseball. I mean, for 10 years, Steve was, uh, was asking me to do the same certification workshops. And, and finally, it was in 2014, uh, we decided, all right, enough's enough. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to create a baseball version of our TPI certifications. And we created a, a certification for pitching and one for hitting. And we started doing it with just MLB teams. We had a lot of connections with trainers and the teams. First team we did was the Angels and then we had the Mariners. And then it just, we just started getting through, through MLB. It started, word started to spread. And, uh, Honestly, about two years ago, we finally decided let's open this up to the public because we've had mm -hmm. enough people did it. And now we do these on base, which uh, we have, I, I think, one of the greatest advisory boards in the world for baseball. You included on that board. And uh, we have over a thousand people, a thousand coaches, trainers and, and medical professionals that are certified already and on base. And over half of them, over 500 of those certified professionals have jobs on MLB teams today. That's great. Which is pretty cool. And I'm curious. So you've charted a ton of rotational patterns, ranging from Tons. golf to tennis yep. to hitting and pitching baseball. I know you've even dabbled in soccer. Yep. Uh, I'm curious how are they? How are they similar? How are they different? You know, is efficient rotation really efficient rotation, or do we have a lot of finer subtleties that we have to consider? Well, I think you've heard me say this before. So when we talk about efficient, that's that's a big word. Like, is it efficient or not? And I always like yeah. to define that first, real quick. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I, we, we believe that there really isn't one way to pitch. There isn't one way to hit. And that's just evidence. You just turn on the TV and watch a game, right? There, nobody looks the same, right? Exactly. Now, so I'm saying it doesn't matter what you look like, but it does. I do believe that there is one efficient way for every player to pitch or hit, but it's based on what they can physically do, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going, listen, if a guy's hip doesn't work this way or if his shoulder doesn't work this way, it doesn't mean he can't pitch or hit. It just will help you explain why he likes to do it that way. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, Absolutely. and I always like to say, let's, 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 let's just make sure that what they're doing doesn't look pretty. Doesn't, I don't care if it looks pretty. I just want to make sure it's efficient. So what does efficient mean? Efficient means number one, you can maximize power with the least amount of effort, right? That, that's a great thing to do because that gives you not only 
the ability to generate more power, but also gives you longevity. So maximize power with the least amount of effort. That's one characteristic that means efficiency to me. Another characteristic is repeatability. You can do it over and over again. And number three would be command. You know where it's going, right? If you have command, you can repeat it and you can maximize power with the least amount of effort. That's efficient. And like you just said, there are tons of different styles that can create efficiency. But the greatest rotational athletes in the world all all usually create efficient patterns very similarly. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me preface that. Like, I always say, like, if I take, uh, if I put you on the Goodyear blimp, right, and I put you above a stadium, and I said, okay, there's three pitchers down there on the mound, and we're in the blimp, right? So we're way above the stadium. And let's say one was Eric Gagne. No, no hold on. Let's, do, let's say one was uh, Lincecum. Let's mm-hmm. say one was Randy jo- or Randy Johnson, and one was uh, let me somewhere in the middle. Uh, uh, let's say uh, Roger Clemens. Okay, let's say those three guys from the blimp. Could you tell me who was who? Uh, absolutely not. You don't think so? I mean, maybe left left versus right, but well, I mean, well, let's well, no. uh, let, yeah. let me make let me make it easier. Roger Clemens versus Lincecum from the blimp. Could you tell me who? Oh, was abs- who? Yeah, I think you can tell that Lincecum was super up tempo his delivery and probably mm-hmm. about. 60 pounds lighter. <laughs> yeah. So I'm saying like they probably, yeah. Lincecum and Clemens probably look completely opposite. I mean, they're, they're, he's got, a, Lincecum had a very unique style, right? Yeah. So I think most people would be like, oh yeah, that's Clemens and that's Lincecum. I think from a, from a visual standpoint, they look very different. But if I look from an efficiency standpoint of how they like generate power and how they transfer their power through their body, which we can measure now today with different mm-hmm. technology, it's hard to tell them apart, right? Mm-hmm. So when you say like how, how similar are rotational athletes? Well, they're almost identical if you look at how they create power and how they transfer power. If you're an overhead throwing athlete, like a javelin player, a tennis server, and a baseball pitcher, I mean, they create power and transfer it through their body almost identically, even though they don't look the same on a video camera. Now, if you take like a hitter, like a striker, they do it a little differently than a, than a thrower. But all strikers, hockey players, golfers, baseball players, almost identical. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, here's where I'm, I'm a little more interested is you just, you made it, you made a very good point. He's like on video, like you right. said that multiple times during that initial yeah. response. Do you think it's a big mistake to, that we see so many coaches who spend a lot of time with, it's almost like an over-reliance on still frame photos where they, they cherry pick certain portions of people's deliveries or swing mechanics. So yeah, let me, let me give you, I, yeah. I always say, so like if we take data on somebody, let's say we take motion capture data. There's three ways to look at the data visual. So we can represent it, make it look like a video, look at pictures or snapshots. Number two is we can look at numbers like snapshots in time. Look at like how much are your hips rotated at the top of the wind up or whatever. Right. Or we can look, we can look at the entire pitch or the entire hit. If you look at either the first two pictures, like snapshots or just data of snapshots in time, all you're getting is what's happening at that specific point in time, right? Like Mm -hmm. a great example of this is if I take, uh, let's say I take the average MLB hitter and I say, how much do they rotate their hips at the end of the negative move when they've loaded, right? And if I, if I take a look at the data and I go, okay, the average hitter somewhere between 20 and 40 degrees pelvic rotated. Okay. Let's just say, I'm just, I'm making something up right now, but it's pretty close. Let's say between 20 and 40 degrees rotated. And I look at your player and I go at the top of the negative move or like when they're done, their hips are at 10 degrees. And I'm just looking at that one snapshot in time, whether I show you a picture or data, most coaches would say, oh, that's not enough. You need to turn more. Right. Mm-hmm. All that's saying is that at that snapshot in time, their hips are only 10 degrees rotated. That doesn't mean that it wasn't 50 degrees earlier. In other words, they can over rotate as they start to move. But when they get to the end of the the weight shift or the end of the load, it could be at 10 degrees. And if you don't know that, if you don't know that it was 40 degrees a couple milliseconds before that, but at this snapshot in time, it's only 10 degrees, you can give them the worst information or worst advice ever. So I'm, I'm always nervous, like when, especially with data, like you said, photos, but data is potentially even worse. If you just look at numbers and you go, let me see what their hip rotation is at the top and their shoulder angles over here. And that is the worst way in the world to coach because you, you really don't know what they were before. You need to see the progression of how they got there and what happens after they leave there. 
that makes sense? I think, yeah, I think it's also, does it, does it lead to a discussion of, of not just positions, but the forces acting on them? Like the, the kinetics Harvard. versus kin- kinematics discussion. Like we hear those, those terms thrown around. This is your world. Explain the, explain the important differentiation. Okay. So, so the first thing is, is you can, the first, I like to call it the, the what, why, and how. Okay. So if mm-hmm. you want to know what's happening, if you want to like, I want to know, did they move to the right? Did they move to the left? Did they go up and down? Did they rotate? That's either video or 3D motion capture, kinematics, we call it. That's like putting sensors on somebody. If you look at kinematics or video, it tells me what's happening. And you can look in six different directions. Are you moving front to back, left to right, up and down? You can see if they're rotating, side bending, or forward bending, right? So those it kind of tells me where I orientation and location, where I am. That's what. If you want to know what somebody's doing, if you want to know if they're swaying, if they're losing space, or if they're casting their hands, that's a video camera or 3D motion capture for kinematics. Now, if you want to know why they're doing that, okay, that's a whole different conversation. So like why somebody's doing it, it could be a physical problem, right? So physical screening helps answer some of the whys, right? Um, there could be equipment problem. They could be doing something because the equipment doesn't fit them properly. And then there's the really important one too is well, how are they doing it? Right. So if I want to know what you're doing, like if I want to know if you're shifting weight to the right, I look at a video camera or 3D motion capture. If I want to know how you're shifting to the right, that's kinetics or force and pressure. That's when we look at the ground to see how they're using ground reaction forces, because I can have three players that move three inches to the right and all three of them can do it in a totally different way. Right. This is a, this is an important point. It's funny. There was a, there was a tweet going around that just earlier this week yeah. that got a lot of like feisty interactions as Twitter will often get. It was a guy with a, a vowel slide underneath his trailing leg. Yep. And when I saw it, I immediately thought of you. I thought of like my research on unstable surface training, all this stuff. But the idea was it allows him to, you know, keep contact with the ground longer on his back leg. I was like, Yes, but the forces that are being applied are entirely different than what actually happens during the pitching motion. And, and <laughs> because the, for sure, the how he was doing it would have been different. For sure. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So the, the, the pos- positions may be the same or seem the same, yep. but forces are where it's at. How are you using the ground, and is that really a skill that will carry over? Yeah, we're working on a uh, – me and a pitching coach by the name of Dominic Johnson here in San Diego are working on a, a baseball that's a force platform too. So we can actually see like when the pitchers, how they're applying force to the baseball, which – I think when we have the foot and the ball, that's going to, that's going to answer a lot of the hows. That's a game changer. Um, so, you know, not everybody has access to really high level, you know, uh, both force plates and, you know, uh, video cameras, obviously, but, yeah. you know, is, is another solution for someone who may just have access to an iPhone to have a lot of critical instances that you look like? It seems like that was something that, yeah, so that's what you know, that's, is that's, that's adequate substance. It's like if, if, yeah. if, 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 you know, what, what's the best video camera on the market right now? You know, everybody's thinking it's like Edgetronics, like, Honestly, your yeah. your iPhone camera at 240 frames a second is pretty freaking special, right? Yeah. You know, so go to slow motion over there. And I just, what I always say to coaches is if somebody hands you a data report or hands you a picture and says, here's their stance, here's their negative move, here's contact. If you give them any advice on what they're doing wrong, you are taking such a gamble because you have no idea how they got to those positions. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're ho- hoping that they're at the right time frame when they took the picture or, or, or even worse, if they gave you data on that. So to me, it's I just feel like you should always watch the entire motion. So, you know how they got there, how they got out of there. That's just that's like one on one. You should always watch the entire thing. If someone's like, well, how many snapshots should I take? Dude, it takes two seconds to watch the entire thing. You should always watch the entire thing. In my opinion. I, I think the other thing, too, is I think a, a lot of people. You know, they, they go through these things, but they, they fail to appreciate that the reason we do it is to, to drive our interventions, whether that's a, a physical intervention to reduce yep. symptoms, to optimize performance or anything like that. I, we do a lot of video and, you know, basically our data assessment with a lot of test retest. Yeah. Like we'll, we'll throw, you know, two 15 pitch innings and do an intervention in the middle and see what happens. Yeah. Um, where you have all the metrics. And I, I don't think a lot of people did it. They almost use it as more descriptive as opposed to intervention based. Have you seen that as well? Yeah. Across your, your different sports? Totally agree. Totally agree. Like I said, I, you know, I, I, I just, I'm always like, don't, don't put your foot in your mouth until you have all the information. And, and, and I feel like, this, you know, one, one of the biggest problems with the whole data movement, right, is, is understanding how to interpret this data. And a lot of times it's because we don't have the right data in front of us. So we're trying to make stuff up. You know what I mean? 
Um, yeah. I mean, I say two, th- let me say two, th- this might be totally off topic, but I feel like baseball has done something crazy backwards in the data world. And I'd say this in my talks all the time is that like, you know, like we go to tons of federations, like Olympic federations. And if, uh, if, uh, let's say the, the Chinese, let's say table tennis Olympic federation calls me and says, Hey, Greg, I want you to come help me. Right. If I walk into that federation, I know for sure when I walk in there, the coaches are going to sit me down and they're going to go, all right, this is what we think we need to measure. Like we want to know, can you give us paddle speed and elbow velocity? The coaches are going to say, here's what's important. And can you give me this? Us data nerds will go, go, let's go look and see what technology we have to measure this. And we'll come back to them and say, okay, you asked for 10 things, coaches. Here's the nine things we can give you. And the coaches are like, this is great. And they use this to make their, like you said, their diagnosis or the recommendation. In baseball, I think the world heard that data was important. And what they did is they went and got a lot of data guys. And I'm sure you've seen this a million times. And they got these data guys. They brought them in. And what did they do? They went to the data guys and they said, what should we measure? <laughs> well, the data guys were like, what do you mean? Aren't you supposed to tell me what you're supposed to measure? So the data guys aren't even baseball guys, and they're going, well, I, I think this is important. You should look at hip rotation at the top of the negative move. or at the, And they give this information to the coaches, and now the coaches are like, oh, this must be important because the data guy asked for this. It's completely backwards, right? <laughs> like, like I, I feel like there's so much data that we're looking at right now that nobody knows how to interpret it because it didn't start with, like, common sense. Exactly. Our rule, our rule of thumb when we meet with our guys is everything has to be a, it's a conversation first. It has to be very subjective before it's objective. Correct. So we, we pull together, you know, 12 to 15 page reports for a lot of our pitchers. And, you know, I, I'd say that actually probably 60% of it is, is really just conversational in nature. That's where we, right. it's what drives our research and, you know, the videos we watch and things like that. So I think too often we look past like the, the building rapport and asking questions and getting right. athlete feedback. Because you can go overhaul the deliverer, but then you realize the guy has ten degrees of hip and turn rotation. Right, you're you're probably you know chasing the wrong you know. But it's even it's situation. like I said, it's even the same thing. Like I don't think a lot of coaches like you're you're asking me like should they just look at these four snapshots in time and make a, a an opinion? I don't think a coach would have ever asked for those four snapshots in time. Those That's are data guys going. Here's four things I think it's important for you to look at. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just think it's asked backwards. It, and well, I think not only that, it's it's one thing to have all that, but it's another thing altogether. And this actually probably leads into my next question: is that to have people that can actually supervise the intervention, whether that's a, a physical <laughs> intervention to, you know, to do some manual therapy or some positional breathing or you know some kind of strength conditioning intervention or something more mechanical in nature, well, whatever that may be, from a skill development standpoint. Well, I'll tell you what I what I tell all my guys. I, I believe in this, I, you know, listen, I'm, I'm coming from the medical world. You're coming from the training in medical world. Mm-hmm. I feel like, uh, it should all be coach driven, right? So mm-hmm. I always say it's like, I, I use the formula one analogy, like the, the coach is the driver of the car, right? The car is the player, right? The coach is the driver, right? The driver is supposed to read the dashboard and kind of figure out how to drive this car properly. Right. And if the car, dashboard has got a red light on it or there's smoke coming out of the tailpipe, the driver pulls the car into the pit crew and says, hey, we got a problem over here. In baseball, you know, it doesn't work like that, right? We have these silos, right? It's like the strength conditioning does one thing and the medical does the other thing. And and the coach is, might says, well, that's not even important. And these guys don't even like each other. And it's just, it's been a really awkward um, dynamics that, like you said, if somebody could put all this together, and it's the best teams in the world, obviously, are doing that, then the 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 all this data turns into actionable items that get corrected, right? Absolutely. And one of the things I I think that is good is we have seen a surge, and and I give a lot of credit to you, like in terms of how you shared this as some of your courses. You know, we've seen a surge in research and applied practice on the coaching front. Nick Winkleman's yeah. done some great stuff in this regard. Absolutely. You know, so we're seeing more information about you know, how random practice can benefit folks more than block practice, yep. how external focus cues can be superior to internal focus cues at times. You know, we've seen a, a big focus on constraint-based learning, yep. uh, particularly in the baseball world. I feel like 
but I think we've also seen this go really, really far in some regards, right? Um, yeah. Where we throw people into random practice scenarios before they have had any chance to develop. You know, it's, it's not like we're training five-year-olds where, you know, I put my daughter on the playground and they figure it out. Right. Um, if you if you give somebody a 315-pound barbell and you tell them to deadlift it, they're not all magically going to default to perfect right. technique. Well, I'll give, so, you, I'll, I'll, give you, yeah. I'll give you a couple things on this that I think yeah. are interesting that people might be messing up. So yeah. – Obviously, the research, I, I had the pleasure to travel the world for three years with uh, Dr. Dick Schmidt and Tim Lee, two of the most published motor learning experts in the world. Uh, we lost uh, Dr. Schmidt a few years ago. He passed away, but Dr. Lee's still around. And those guys taught me more about how to coach and, like you said, when to apply, random, and all that kind of stuff. And the one thing that I think is very, very evident on most of the research is both block and random and internal, external, they, they all work. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's always they're kind of debating which one gets you there faster. Right. So exactly. I never want to say anything's negative. Right. So it's, it's still better than nothing. Yeah. Then and, and then I think one of the the um, I think I think people um, um, from a, uh, a random versus block training um, type of practice. One of the things you're going to hear all the time is that if you do random practice, you're actually learning. Right. So if you want to build a new, let's say a player has a mechanical yeah. fault and you want to change a new fault, random learning is kind of like doing random multiplication to learn multiplication. Block would be like if I said, what's 12 times 11? You said 12 times 11, a thousand times in a row. That doesn't really teach you how to do math. It, you, it just teaches you how to remember what 12 times 11 is. Right. Mm -hmm. But as soon as somebody gives you another pro, a, a problem, you don't know how to do it. So we understand random makes you solve the problem, do it all over again. Right. But the, there's some really interesting things that happen with block practice. And when you do block practice, like if we just did 12 times 11, like let's say we're going to do free throws on basketball, right? Let's say you and I both suck. And you said, I'm just going to go do a thousand free throws in a row. And I'm just going to do random shots around the court, right? The research will say in the game, I'll make more free throws than you, right? Just because that's just how it works is that uh, random tends to work. But the research always sa also says is that if we were just to practice, right? Let's say you practice for an hour just throwing free throws for an hour and I'm doing random shots for an hour. If we tested us after that hour on just free throws, you would win, right? Because you just did an hour of free throws. Of course, you're going to be better right now. So you mm -hmm. can actually, you'll perform better in practice with block practice. It's just, you didn't really learn a lot. Like in two days later, your retention is not going to be that great. Well, think about this in baseball. If I want you to learn at certain times, but I also want you, I want you to perform better at certain times, right? So if we're saying, hey, listen, I want you to learn a new pitch, right? There's a time to do that, but it's probably not right before the game, right? It's, it's, it's maybe early, let's say one of the days you're not pitching or off season, you're going to try and learn these and we do random. But if it's like the day of the game and we're trying to warm up, well, the research is really clear. If you do block practice, you'll actually perform better that day. Right. So I think a lot of people make this mistake that, you know, most of the learning guys will tell you, like, if, if I'm going to go play golf and on the driving range right before I play, I'm probably going to do block practice because number one, it makes a little makes me confident. I'll, I'll perform better that day and I'll, and I'll and I'll do OK. But if I'm going to go practice, not when I'm going to play and I want to learn something that's new to the repertoire, or learn a new way to hit a shot, I should do that random practice, but not right before I go play. So I there's a place for both of these, if this makes sense. Block and random are both very applicable depending on when we're doing it and why we're doing it, right? Absolutely. That, that's, that's a great synopsis. I think it's an important one because, uh, you know, I think we do see random practice, I think, you know, maybe random practice with external focus cues. It's an interesting combination that generally works really, really well. But I think we all see, yeah, we see scenarios where it's, it's utilized as a, you know, it's a, it's a crutch for lazy coaching where something looks horrific. It looks dangerous, but Hey, they'll figure it out, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, and well, they're being exposed to new movement patterns. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you like the learn learning guys were very clear on this. Like, uh, you know, if you're going to do random practice and external cues, they have to be able to at least understand what they're supposed to do and have at, yeah. le at least be able to execute the program correctly. Yeah. If they don't even know how to do it or they don't even know what they're supposed to do, they would always do block first. And I think it has to be a, a safe environment, you know, what I mean, where, you, where it's it's totally fine to fail. It's it's a different thing altogether to 
you know, shoot from 18 feet instead of 16 feet yeah. as compared to going out and trying to squat a thousand pounds when you haven't even squatted 200 or something along those Absolutely. lines. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the moral, the moral story is the best in the world use a combination of both of these. Do not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I'll be honest. I use internal focus cues every single day when I teach cuff, cuff exercises, scapular control stuff. There's nothing better than putting people in the position. Well, let, let me, on. let me tell you a little bit about that research. So, so yeah. the people who did the research on internal versus external and I, I, Obviously, it can be wrong, but I've looked, mm -hmm. I've read a lot of this research, mm -hmm. and I'm telling you, a lot of times what they do is they go, okay, let's take a group of, let's say, let's 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 take a group of, I'll do my sport, let's say golfers, right? And I say my sport, I think I'm, I've done more baseball than golf in the last two years, but let's say let's take, <laughs> we take golfers and we say, okay, this one group over here, they're going to hit balls, and we're going to give them knowledge of results. We're going to say, hey, uh, on every shot, if it was too long, too short, left or right, that's an external cue. And you're going to practice every shot. It's like, oh, that was too long. Go shorter, shorter. And then we're going to take this other group over here and they're going to do internal focus. We're going to say, uh, okay, you need to keep your right elbow in a better position. I'm just making something up, right? So the research, what they do is they give one group of people an internal cue, like keep your spine angle up or keep your elbow. And the other one, they give them external cues. And the research will say the ones who get the external cues always perform better. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing that you know and I know is the people in the group that were getting the internal cue, like let's say you take 100 people and say, keep your elbow in. How many of them needed to keep their elbow in, right? So <laughs> That's a great point. So the, if, they, if they actually took expert coaches and went to each one of them and said, let's do an evaluation, and on each one of them, this is what you need to think of, and this is what you need to think of, I would put that up against external cues any day, any day of the week. And there's definitely, our goal is, Internal cues, I think, help you get the feel of what you're trying to learn. And then once you have it, of course, we try and shift to external. And one of the things that I, I actually talk about is, you know, if we're going to dumb it down to the absolute most, I look at, you know, it, external focus cues for performance, internal for where people want to feel it. And yeah. it, like I, there's yeah. two studies. It was Sarman in 2009 with glute activation um, during hip extension and yep. palm root at 95, which did one on EMG of shoulder muscles without a change in position. And I think what we have to appreciate is there's also a difference between, uh, Arthur Kinemax and osteokinemax. A hundred percent. And, and a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate what's actually happening at the joint level. They're thinking just in the context of, you know, the big flexion extension and they're not really talking about the rolling, the rocking and the right. gliding that's, that's taking place. So I, there's definitely a place for both. And I think it's, it's good to hear you talk about it with your, with your background that you've, you've been exposed to both. You use both in both random and blocked and, and internal All and the external. Time. All the time. What, where, where do you see people going the, the most wrong with this stuff? Like, what do you see right now I, I think it's, that I think makes it's like you I, cringe? I think, I think it's like I said, on, on most of this stuff is people hear, they hear about research. This, this is my pet peeve on research, is people read an abstract or a conclusion, which is basically the subjective opinion of the person who did the research. And they, they hold it up as this is the most important thing. First of all, I would always say anything that you read about research wise, you should actually, actually go read the study just so you can yeah. make sure you make the same conclusion. Look at and the data sets. Look at the data set. <laughs> you know, it's like static stretching, taking away power. For years, people were like saying we don't do static stretching because of this one little, which is just insane. But it basically what I'm saying is that don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you hear something like, oh, you should only do random practice. Just think logically before you say, I'm never doing block again. Um, it, there's probably more to the story than you're thinking. Let's just put it Absolutely. that way. That, that's that's right. the moral story. Yep. Great stuff. All right. I know long-term athletic development is a topic that's near and dear to you. And um, I want to dig in a little bit deeper on that front. And and I'm curious because you've had, obviously, tons of exposure to golf and to tennis. Yep. You know, sports, you know, along with maybe gymnastics that tend to peak very early, whereas most of our other sports tend to peak a lot later. Um, what do you, you know, think, what do you think the average, uh, PGA tour player, how long does it take? Yeah, that's great. That, that's a good point. That's a long, long career for 20, most of 22 like, years average. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. And, and, yeah. you know, I, I've heard in baseball, I've heard, you know, the useful life of a baseball player is 26 to 32 yep. thrown around in some circles. And obviously baseball is going through a correction right now where older players are being effectively undervalued compared to what they used to be. Yep. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, do you think that those athletic lifespan and the time they kick in should govern, you know, approaches, you know, if you have a 11 year old that's wildly passionate about being a LPGA member compared to a, a soccer player, do you need to attack it markedly differently? Okay. So first, first thing was there are sports that we classify into one of two buckets. There's either early specialization sports or late specialization sports. 
And early specialization sport is a sport that if we don't develop the talent when they're really young, they miss the window to excel. Like, um, I would say gymnastics or, or diving or dance. So you're not going to see like, uh, you know, somebody in their forties, usually in some of those sports. So there are sports that, exactly. that like in the Olympics are dominated by teenagers, right? So if you're trying to go to a sport that's dominated by teenagers, you can't say, oh, don't specialize until you're a teenager. It's too late, right? The best in the world are already doing it. The good news is most sports, golf, tennis, baseball, football, are not early specialization sports. They are late specialization sports. So if you look at most of the sports that if you look at professionals that play when they're in their 20s or 30s, you're looking at a, a late specialization sport. And what we've learned about late specialization sports is crystal clear, and it's very difficult to go back in time. I always tell my parents, you've got one chance to do this right. You cannot go <laughs> back in time, right? And the one thing that is very clear on all these late specialization sports, the best of the best, were athletes first, and then they were specific to their sport second. In other words, they were an athlete before they were a pitcher. They were an athlete before they were a golfer. Right. So what that means is they athlete is somebody who has multiple, you know, athletic skills. They can, they have agility, they have locomotion, they have object control. They can, they have all these, these skills. And the problem we're seeing is if you take some of these kids and you early specialize them and you say, I'm going to turn you into a baseball player first and then try and turn you into an athlete second, you can't go back in time. It's so much easier to develop the athlete when they're young. It's easier to develop the sports specificity later in life. Right. So. Um, that, that's the biggest mistake parents make. That's the biggest mis- difference between the different early specialization and late specialization sports, early specialization sports. You don't really have time to develop the athlete. You have to, you have to develop the sports specific first. Um, but I can just tell you like just countless examples of, from guys like Mike Trout to guys like, you know, if I look at, uh, if I go right now into golf, Brooks Kepka or Dustin Johnson, all the, the best players in the world, they were 100% multi-sport athletes that then started to specialize when they were 14 or 15 years old. And that's, those are the ones that win the gold medals, the ones that get the biggest contracts, that the that, uh, best players in the world. The ones that early specialize, unless you're an early specialization sport, are usually the ones we – there's a, a very famous guy in the long-term athletic development world. His name is Istvan Bali, pretty much mm-hmm. helped bring this from Hungary into the Western world. He calls it early ripe equals early rot. <laughs> and I just can't, I cannot overemphasize that enough. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting too. What, what really supports that notion entirely in the baseball is look at the major league baseball draft. It yep. is largely a crapshoot when you select high school baseball players, you know, college players are three, three, three years further along. And obviously there's a level of maturity. They've been exposed to more competition. They're easier to scout. Um, but I do think that we have a lot of high school athletes that are still, still fi- finding that skill development. Well, now you're, now you're talking about talent yeah. identification, which is even worse, yeah. right? So <laughs> the, the evidence is so clear on this. If you try and identify talent before they're done with their growth spurt, most mm-hmm. coaches will pick. And when they say most coaches, almost 96% of the coaches that have been tested on this will guess wrong who the most talented athlete is. Because if I look at two kids, let's say that are 11 years old, right? And I go, man, that one kid there is so much better. He's going to be the next Mike Trout. You're probably telling me which kid is more advanced developmental wise, as in like he's already gone through his growth spurt. Like, cause all 11 year olds are not created the same. One kid, if you, anybody has multiple kids, no. Kids hit their growth spurts at different ages. So what you're doing is you're telling me who's more mature. Like the 11 year old might act more like a 13 year old, or this other 11 year old might act more like a nine year old. That just means that, that the 11 year old who's acting like a nine year old is just a late bloomer. But once he does bloom and hits his growth spurt, well, then we can compare because what I always tell coaches, I go, if you're telling me at least two 11 year olds, that one there is better. Okay. You're probably telling me he's more mature. So I, I can actually, we can go in and calculate what his real biological age is. And if, if he's an early bloomer, yeah, his chronological age is 11, but he's probably more like a 13-year-old. So now I would say, let's compare him to the other 13-year-olds. Do you still think he has talent? Most coaches will be like, oh, no, he's not as good as a 13-year-old. I'm like, well, that's who you should have been comparing him to because you're comparing him against late bloomers. And more often than not, we're taking that kid and he's the one that gets overused by the crazy little league coach because he is better than his peers. And at least the early ripe, early rot. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
I'm curious though, uh, and actually this is a, an interesting maybe discussion point is I actually polled, uh, I think there was a, there was a day, maybe two off seasons ago, where we had like 41 pro baseball players that, yep. that came through our facility. And I was really intrigued. I was like, Hey, how many of you guys played at area codes? You know, so area codes yep. is the top 220 high school baseball players in the country all gather in Long Beach every August and you know, there's scouting directors and yep. GMs and everybody in the stands. And one of the 41 was selected for an area code team. And this is, this is a, you know, room that had, Probably fifteen to twenty yeah. big leaguers coming through that yeah. day. Do, do the same thing one. for the Little League World Series. Yeah, it's <laughs> true, and, and it's 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 absolutely shocking. So I'm curious, as you look at the the baseball development world, if you can map out like an ideal timeline. And obviously, it's very uh, specific to kids. Do you see a timeline? I know what I've seen personally. Like we've had kids that have been with us when they were twelve who are now in the big leagues. So we've yep. we've seen this athletic lifespan, and I get frustrated when I see coaches speaking very vehemently about how young kids should train when they've never actually built a sample size to say how what worked and what didn't and we've made mistakes along the way with with how we brought kids along and what yep. we've done and we've learned our lesson and take our licks do you think that there's an ideal uh like long-term approach i mean I, I, yeah. the last thing i want to do is give the the father of a the crazy father of a seven-year-old ideas with this um oh no kids i definitely kids, i mean but, i think that we have so much evidence on yeah, asking, it, like what's the best way to do long-term athletic development for sure there are critical windows, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the LTAD world will tell you that uh, there are these windows of opportunities where the stars align, where you can actually develop humans in uh, certain skills better at these times in their life than any other time in their life. Like, for example, um, when a kid is growing really fast, like when you're born, that's the one time in your life where you're growing the fastest, right? So from birth to like five to five, six years old, you're growing faster than any other time in your life. And if I'm talking boys specifically, when they get to around seven, eight years old, they start to slow down, right? So they're not growing as fast. And then it gets to this point around 11 or 12, where all of a sudden they hit the puberty growth spurt and they start growing really fast again, right? Now, anytime you're growing fast, a weird phenomenon happens in your body. Your bones grow faster than your muscles. And when your bones grow faster than your muscles, the muscles get put on tension. So it's kind of, I always say it's like a bow and arrow. I tell the parents, I'm like, you get this bow and arrow, the bow is growing right now. This is like where people get growing pains. The bow is growing, but the string is not. So what happens is the string, it gets put on tension. So think about it, when a bow and arrow, when the string gets put on tension, can you shoot the arrow faster? Yeah, you can. And it's actually a great time in life to work on speed development. And we can actually develop speed faster at that point in time with kids than almost any other time in your life. So we always try and do lots of speed stuff when they're really young, and we try and do speed stuff in their growth spurt. That's one example. Like there's certain times where testosterone kicks in. What's one of the best times to learn strength? And there's times when you're not growing fast. It's a great time to learn skill. And if you kind of, if you, if you go along with this human physiological, neurological, hormone development times and you match your training, some really special stuff happens, right? And this is where some of the best athletes of all time, they just got lucky. They kind of did the right things at the right time. And that's why we always say athlete first, because an athlete, you're doing so many different things. Usually you're going to hit those windows, whether you know you are or not. But if you just specialize in one sport, the chance of you hitting these windows is very slim. So did you just in a roundabout way agree with me when I say that 13 year old signing up for cross country is not a great baseball development option? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah, I could think of a lot of different things that I might do for if you're trying to get crossover. <laughs> into, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I look at this, you know, if I'm going to develop the athlete first, I always try and figure out like what athletic skills would be best for a baseball player. If I'm trying to turn them into a baseball player, right. Mm -hmm. Is baseball more of an endurance sport or is it a high intensity, you know, interval type of sport? And of course, I mean, I don't think you're going to be running laps around the park. Right. So I think, yeah. I think we're looking for ballistic athletes. Right. Yeah. So even though 13 might be a great time to start building cardiovascular endurance type of stuff, I, it, it, there's really only a couple advantages of that for baseball. Yeah. So I, I would see a lot more time invested in other things for sure. The other thing I think is, is a, an important takeaway from that conversation is you see a lot of the, the big kids at 13, right? Mm -hmm. What happens, they get, they get put on the mound and they get put at first base. Probably yeah. the two positions that require the least amount of movement, maybe secondary to catching because <laughs> catching just, although they run to cover first base, they get a lot of work in. So <laughs> I, when I, when I see kids that get pushed into like the pitcher only spot at 12, 13, it loses sight of the fact that those are actually the players that probably need that power stimulus 
the most because they are the most, you know, kind of potentiated to be really, really springy. So if you're a parent listening to this, like get your kids playing multiple sports that age. Don't have them just standing at, at one position all the time. Let them experience. And by the way, like I said, the, the data is really clear. The late bloomers have an advantage. Like the, mm-hmm. the best players in the world in history were late bloomers, not early bloomers. So the one that everybody thinks is like, this is the kid is the next superstar. It's not. It's the one that's somewhere in the middle of a pack or the lower because they tend to work harder. They, they learn that it requires hard work to have success. Everything doesn't just come easy to them. And there's a lot of evidence that says that if, if you stay in your, your athletic development phase or the, uh, you, you haven't hit your growth spurt yet and you have to spend more time learning things that there's an advantage once you hit your spurt. So just make sure you're not you're not doing that like talent identification before growth spurt. Once the growth spurts happen, you can talent identify. Before that, do not do that. Have you seen have you seen specific windows of opportunity for for teaching and developing rotational capabilities? I mean, I know you guys at TPI have had young kids that come in and it's I mean, I know you joked at one presentation that it was it was a fitness class that has golf clubs, but <laughs> yeah. do you see do you see certain windows like like Rick Ankiel is one of my neighbors and Rick was out with like his son the other day and they were swinging golf clubs and he's got like a pristine swing and he's right. you know fir- first grade, you know, and you know I'm sure a lot of it's from watching dad, but you know, are there certain times when you feel like it's best to teach those rotational capabilities as opposed to letting them happen organically? Well, I, I think, I think, uh, let me, I'm going to answer this maybe not the way you're thinking, but I, there are times to learn skill. Like for boys mm-hmm. from eight to 12 is when most boys aren't growing very fast. Anything about mm-hmm. when you're not growing fast, you can learn skills like crazy, right? So mm-hmm. um, the skill of like how to, how to rotate or how to load, we teach during that phase. When they hit their growth spurt, they're like a Dalmatian puppy, right? They get very uncoordinated. We just try and keep from skill regression. We don't try and add skills. And then there's windows, like in the growth spurts, we go, we add speed to that rotation, right? So we'll add the speed development during that time. And then once they get to their, what we call peak height velocity, when they're growing the fastest, most boys, it's around 13, somewhere in there. That's when testosterone spikes. So now we'll add the strength to the rotation because that's when you can get true hypertrophy now. Before it was just neurological strength. Now that you've got testosterone, you can actually build hypertrophy strength. So we'll add the strength. And then once you have the speed and you have the strength for rotation, then that's the power window opens up because now it's speed strength, right? So that usually comes in in that 15 range where we'll start adding all the rotary power stuff. So if I were to put that into like a uh, a program, I would say really young is speed of, and, and uh, like five, six, seven, speed development. Then when they get to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, we're teaching them the skills of rotational movement. When they hit their growth spurt at 12, we go back to adding speed to that new skill. When they hit their peak height velocity, 13, when they grow, can't grow any faster, the, we testosterone spiking, we add the strength to that component. And then once we, let's say we do a year of year and a half of strength, get into that 15 range, now we have speed and strength. Well, that's the formula for power. So now we start doing power drills. That's kind of how we do it. This is awesome. All right. So let's, let's talk about on base. You, yep. um, folks can obviously find you on Twitter and Instagram. It's at on base you and it's on base you.com, but describe a little bit more about what folks can expect when they, when they spend that weekend with you guys. Like, you got I've it. been to them and they're outstanding, but oh. I feel like it's always best to hear it directly from the man himself. Cool. You got it. So basically the way our workshops work is you sign up for the class online. Um, right now our hitting class has an online prereq. It's about a three hour online class that just prepares you for the live two day workshop. You go to the two day workshop, 16 hours. Uh, you go to this nine to five workshop and we offer these all over the country. And after the workshop, you sit an online certification exam. Right now we have the same thing for pitching as well. The only thing we don't is we have an online class prereq class coming for pitching. That's probably going to launch somewhere around April. Right now, it's just the two-day live class, and then you sit the certification. Um, obviously, if you take a pitching class for us once the online class launches, you'll just get that as a resource. We have a fast-pitch softball class coming out this summer, and then we have uh, we have some advanced classes. We have all these level twos that are be launching at the end of the year. We've got a level two pitching class, a level two hitting class. We've got a level two fitness and medical. All those are going to be launching over the next 12 to 18 months, and uh, we're we're really excited about it. Crushing. I'm looking at the schedule right now. They're coming to Atlanta, Chicago, and Phoenix. And we got back to back. We got Dallas. We got Dallas. Too. We got Dallas in July, Atlanta oh, nice. in in August, and uh, Chicago in I think September, and then Phoenix in November. Yep. 
You know, Greg is a, a road warrior and these are outstanding. So I would definitely encourage you guys to check them out. So before you go, two books that you feel like anybody in the baseball world or any rotational uh, sport world could really benefit from reading. Yeah. Um, I, you know, people always ask me that question and I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you two that I think nobody would probably tell you. Okay. So, or maybe you probably heard this, but number one, for sure. And cause we already talked about it. I, I've never read a textbook from front to cover in like two days, but if you take the motor, motor learning and, or, or sorry, motor control and learning by Dr. Richard Schmidt and Tim Lee, uh, I think they're on, I think the the last one was, I think, uh, version six or they're on version six or seven. So it's motor control and learning. I, if you're a coach and you work with players and you want them to learn, it's just, it's, if I was the king for the day, uh, that's what I'd make you, make you learn. I like it. Okay. So that, All right. That, and then what's, what's number two? Yeah. What do you got? Number two, I, and this is not what you were asking, but I, I always tell the people that come to our workshops, most of the coaches out there, and I'm assuming coaches, strength coaches, medical, the ones listening to your podcast, they're trying to run a business. And I, I, I feel like there was, I, I feel like I've been very successful in business. And one of the reasons was a book I read when I was really, when I first started out that I wish more guys would read. And it's just about learning how to manage your business, run your business. It's called the E Myth. Have you ever read the E Myth? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like Gerber's E Myth is one of those things where more guys need to do that, and then we'd have more qualified guys that would still be in business doing some good stuff. That's tremendous. Very, very good. Very, very different in your yeah. two recommendations, yeah. but equally important. So, yeah. all right, this has been awesome, Greg. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, good luck with the Yankees, buddy. Thanks. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email EliteBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.